from the News Channel 5 Network. This is Open Line. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Open Line. Glad you are with us. It's Tuesday, March 30th, 2021. And on this date, we are talking about the first 100 days of President Joe Biden's administration. How is it going? What do you think? We're 100 days in, about, and and wh wh how, do you, how do you think it's going? It's certainly a different feel than the last four years. Um, I haven't seen a lot of controversial tweets. Um, there have been some major executive orders that kind of overturned some of the things that, that President Trump did, certainly very focused on the coronavirus. Um, but just what, what are your thoughts? How do you think it's going? Um, and we want to hear from you. And I'm, I'm open to hearing from, of course, both sides. So we're going to do that. But as uh, to help with our conversation, we're very lucky to have Dr. Thomas Swartz, Vanderbilt political science professor, joining us, as all of our guests do now via Zoom. So Dr. Swartz. Dr. Swartz. Oh, thank you for uh, yes. having me on the program. Yep. <laughs> I don't see you, but I hear you. So thank you for being here. I know that you're joining okay. us via Zoom. Thank you. Um, okay. I, what, what are your thoughts? I mean, here we are, first 100 days or so. How, how do you think it's going for, for President Biden? Well, I think he's 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 had a very good start um, on many respects. In many respects, with probably one the one exception I'd, I'd make to the his start is the border issue, um, which does not look as as good as, as some of the other things. But certainly on coronavirus, he's gotten the vaccinations going um, quite. They've ramped up uh, nicely. Uh, looks like he's going to beat all the deadlines that he set, which were probably modest in the first place. But nevertheless. Um, we're looking toward almost 100 million people vaccinated, uh, at least with the first shots by, by this weekend. So I think on that score, the coronavirus, which was the major issue and still is the major issue most Americans care about, he's, he's doing well. The other, he got, his, um, he got the stimulus bill passed. He got a, a, an enormous stimulus bill passed. It was purely on party vote, but it's something that's popular with most Americans and, and I think uh, is something people, you know, getting $1,400, most Americans, fourteen hundred dollars in the bank account so that's a that's also something that um, certainly pleases lots of people his popularity is in the solid 50 plus percent even up close to 60 so uh, all those things I think have gone very well if, if there's one sort of note that's not gone as well it's probably the images from the border and uh, particularly the the sense that uh, there's lots of kids coming to the United States unaccompanied this sort of thing and what to do about that but outside of that, I think he's off to a good start. Off to a good start. Um, the coronavirus, you're right. He, he set some goals, and maybe maybe they were modest. He said he wanted 100 million people vaccinated in his first 100 days, and, and he's going to well exceed that, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so that's, that's moving along well. I guess the question becomes, what, what is it? How, how do you feel like he will be judged? Is it, is it the coronavirus? Certainly, I've seen the other side really get upset about the border. There's some people who are going to be very upset about the border. Um, is that more of a political issue or is that an issue that's front of mind for everyday Americans? I guess that's the big question. Yeah, I think I think the, the key issue, according to the polls and what you can measure, is the coronavirus. It's getting life back to normal. Certainly the border is an issue for some, but it, that's not the, the thing that he'll be judged on is how quickly he handles the coronavirus problem and how quickly Americans get back to normal. And that's um, that is uh, the number one at least from every indication polling that I've seen, that's the number one issue for most Americans. He said he wanted all schools reopened. He wanted children back in mm -hmm. school. Um, some organization that tracks that said 47% of K through 12 grade students are in person every day. I'm surprised it's not higher than 47%, but I guess there's some very right. large districts where they're not in every day. But right. certainly you would hope by the fall that they'll be there. I guess the question is, can, can we get to a point, and will he get credit for, and I don't know why he, he wouldn't, but would he get credit for kind of turning the page on the coronavirus? And if he does, that's, I would a, think so. yeah, that's a big thing, right? I mean, that's a pretty big thing. Yes. Yeah, no, there'll be, you know, there, there will be, of course, the argument that the uh, Operation Warp Speed was a Trump initiative and getting the vaccines quickly was... But certainly, I think most people will feel that if we get back to normal by the fall uh, or into the summer, if people can travel and people can enjoy a vacation and that sort of thing, um, and if the economy revives, which it seems to show good signs of doing, 
I think that will all redound to his credit. He'll have a lot. Uh, he'll 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 have a he'll have banked a lot of credit if, if all those things hold for the fall. And as as somebody who studies history and and kind of where we are and everything, all right, I know there is pressure from the left to forget about the filibuster and just start passing as much as you can through the Senate mm -hmm. uh, with obviously just the barest of, of, of majorities. Do you think he's going to do that? Do you think that's a good idea? You know, where, where do you think that whole debate goes? Well, I do think the next bill he's going to try, it seems like it's going to be an infrastructure bill. And depending on how it's it's set up and sold to the American people, it, if it if it enjoys the same level of popularity as the uh, stimulus, as the coronavirus stimulus bill did, I think that could be an opening wedge toward getting more legislation passed. Um, if uh, if the Republicans try and block it on the fili on on sort of filibuster type grounds, where they they try to do it uh, for demanding a vote of 60, and it is and it is a popular measure. That could provide Biden with an opportunity to challenge the filibuster and possibly to win if it's a popular vote. I think some of the other measures that they're thinking of using to try and break the filibuster aren't quite as popular. So I think they might use infrastructure as a way to try to drive a wedge into the filibuster. Particularly, Biden also has not been completely clear about what he He said initially that he wanted a talking filibuster back. Uh, rather than complete ending of the filibuster, forcing senators to actually be in the chamber and be talking and holding the floor. Um, if, they, if that is the first reform, that may, may begin the process of, of loosening the rules on the filibuster. But it, that, I, think, I think the problem with this is that it's a, it's a dangerous test because uh, if they end the filibuster on this, um, you know, this is what happened with Harry Reid getting rid of the filibuster for judicial nominations is that this allowed the Republicans to put in three very conservative justices. So Democrats do have to think that if they end the filibuster, um, the next time the Republicans get in, they're going to pass their legislation as well. So I do think this has to be a trade-off, and they have to decide what's most important to get across and see if they can do it without completely upending all the Senate rules. On the Republican side, and I think we can talk more about that because I'm fascinated by that. Is the filibuster a, a good thing philosophically? And, and we can talk more about that because, well, and, and let me ask a question about it. Right now, would it require 60? Is that right? To You would need um, 60 votes to get something through to, to that would not be subject to a filibuster. Is that right? That is the normal process. There is, of course, this reconciliation process that's been used. You can only use it three times, though, and they've used one of that those opportunities already with the uh, coronavirus stimulus bill. So they're limited in the number of times they can use it, and it can't be a measure that can affect aspects of the budget. So it has to be a. Um, uh, there are there are limitations to using the simple majority. Uh, and not opening up a bill to the uh, filibuster-proof 60 votes, um, which is what is required for most legislation. So there's a uh, right now there are limits on how often they can try and push a bill through without the 60 votes. Um, that's that's the uh, 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 the restriction right now. How effective a strategy is it, in your opinion, for Republicans to basically oppose almost everything to oppose? They obviously opposed the stimulus package, which was pretty popular. Um, under Obama, they opposed a lot. Um, Obama had to use executive orders and, and that kind of thing. They opposed many, many things. Biden was certainly around for that, and I feel like he didn't waste any time just moving forward with this stimulus package. But is that, do you think that is effective? I think some people thought it, might, it, it, may, it may have been effective under Obama. Um, but, but do you think that's effective, and do you think Republicans are looking to do that again? Uh, I think the interesting thing to me is that um, even moderate Republicans ended up opposing the stimulus bill. So they clearly saw aspects of the stimulus bill and some of the provisions in the stimulus bill, which went way beyond simply a stimulus bill. There were Republicans who were willing to settle for a much smaller bill, the ones who went to try and negotiate um, with Biden early on, and he dismissed that. He wanted to go big. And there are reports that he is um, tempted he actually met with a group of historians um, who encouraged him to go big in uh, several spending bills now. So this infrastructure bill 
that he's um, going to um, uh, uh, reveal tomorrow sounds like it's going to be a very large bill, another large bill. And to a certain extent, the Republicans might oppose it on the basis of, of the sheer size of it in terms of what it would add to the U.S. debt and the rest and the possibility that it will have taxes. Now, this is this is something that hasn't been raised. It wasn't raised by the stimulus bill is the idea of what if there are additional taxes connected to this. Now, Biden has said he won't raise taxes on anyone earning um, uh, less than four hundred thousand dollars. But they've modified that a little bit by now saying that they might mean couples as well. So that's 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 something that would be interesting to see. But then uh, uh, Secretary of Transportation Buttigieg suggested the possibility of some sort of mileage tax um, to pay for transfer to pay for a stimulus or a uh, infrastructure bill. So taxes could allow the Republicans to take an oppositional stance that might be more popular than their stance against the stimulus bill. But you're right that simply saying no all the time might not be the best strategy. They may need to, they're going to need to be careful that they're not saying no to something that's very popular or Biden might be able to use that as an opportunity to end the filibuster. What do you think about this parallel in history? And again, I like talking to you because of your knowledge of history. But of course, all right, we had the Spanish flu, right, back in 1918. We had two years, and that was essentially two years. And when you look back, I, I, when you look back about what we did during the Spanish flu, it's the same kind of thing we did now. Social distancing, churches had to worship um, not in person. There was, there was pushback and, and many of the same debates. We come out of the Spanish flu, and then we have the 20s, the 1920s, which were a very mm -hmm. prosperous time. Of course, we had the Depression later, but the 20s were a very prosperous time. Do you think there could be mirrors here? Um, I mean, has, has that crossed your mind that here we are, you know, and we could be going into the 2020s, and it could be with a stimulus and maybe whatever else they're throwing out there. This could be a very prosperous time. Yes, actually, I do think um, there is the possibility of a very, very prosperous time. The difference would be that what you had in the in Washington in the 1920s was a much more limited government that did not actually wanted to restrict government spending. And so President Harding and Coolidge actually cut government spending and sort of it, uh, went away from that. The, the prosperity of the 20s was one that largely resided in the private sector and was not uh, either regulated or stimulated by government in the same way as I think would be the case in the 2020s when you have a democratic administration that sees one of its tasks, particularly as trying to create greater equity. So, and perhaps a redistribution of resources as well. Um, so I think that while the parallels might be ex uh, interesting in terms of an economic boom after the pandemics, um, I think the government thinking might be different and that um, where you went from an unregulated uh, laissez-faire type government in the 1920s, that this government would be more inclined to regulate or to possibly try to use the prosperity to achieve greater equity in the society through redistribution policies. That's very interesting. Do you think that President Biden gets penalized with uh, voters, his popularity goes down, if there is not unity in Washington, if he can't get bipartisan support for things, does that um, hurt him? Not if he accomplishes things. I think um, I think the, the 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 real marker people have is are things getting better? Um, is the economy coming back? Uh, is coronavirus tamed? Does the society look like things are better in general? That there's less um, perhaps less social uh, tension, um, less crime, or less um, uh, uh, polarization, you know, violence, this sort of thing. So if people have a sense that things are getting better, um, regardless of what's going on in Washington, I think he'll be rewarded. Um, and, and that's why I think he's actually in a very good position because the pandemic was so restrictive of American life that the simple easing of restrictions and the fact people can go to baseball games or can go to events, those sorts of things will create, I think, psychologically, a real morale boost that probably will redound to his favor. What did you think of he had his first news conference uh, just recently. Mm -hmm. He had a, a news conference later, I believe, than any president has ever waited to have a news mm -hmm. conference. Um, what, how, how did you? How do you think that went? Um, what were some of the criticisms that you've heard, and what were some of the the things he was uh, praised on? 
or four? Well, it was an unusual. It, w- it was kind of an unusual news conference in that I think the Washington press corps showed how, in some ways, how much of a bubble it lives in, that it didn't ask any questions about coronavirus, didn't ask things that are on Americans' mind about the virus. And that it asked a lot about the filibuster and about issues that are connected to Washington politics. But in a way, it didn't get at what I think a lot of Americans are interested in. And in that sense, I thought it didn't really reflect terribly well on the Washington press corps. It also, I think it was pretty clear that some of the reporters um, uh, held their punches a little bit more than they did would have with Donald Trump. They don't, they like Joe Biden and they're not gonna be as tough. Some of them even sort of preface questions by saying what a good and decent man he was. And I mean, that <laughs> is a very different change of tone from how they handled and dealt with Donald Trump. Um, I, I think um, it was interesting, some of the questions on the border, um, uh, some of the things uh, President Biden said about that could have been more rigorously fact-checked by the reporters if they had wanted to. Um, he did read from notes much more. He reminded me a little of Ronald Reagan in that. Uh, Ronald Reagan was a great communicator, but he was a terrible, he wasn't very good in press conferences and he needed more notes. And in that sense, Biden had a, a number of notes and things like that that he relied on more uh, than uh, some of our previous or uh, recent presidents. Um, but I can see why in a, in a way, press conferences are in his strength and, and uh, it's not a surprise that he waited a long time. That They don't help him that much. and. Um, there's something that the reporters want, but not necessarily, the Americans really don't care that much about them. Um, so I, I think um, it, it, it certainly was, didn't hurt him particularly. He did, he did fine, he was, you know, he was able to answer the questions and everything, but it wasn't a particularly stellar performance, and I don't think I, I, I can see why he hasn't been anxious to do them. Right, and were you surprised or interested, or what, what adjective would you use uh, when he was asked, "Are you? Do you plan to run again?" and he said, "Yes." What? What? What do you think about that? Well, I think that it makes perfect sense, and, and um, you know, there is a. I have an interesting historical parallel with that. Is that when Gerald Ford took over for Richard Nixon, his initial inclination was not to run uh, for president again, uh, to, to just serve out the two years um, as a sort of caretaker. Uh, but uh, Henry Kissinger, his uh, Secretary of State at the time, sort of advised him and said, you'll be a lame duck, you won't be able to get anything done if people don't think you're going to be around or that you're going to run for re-election. And I remembered that story when I, I saw Biden say that, because even if he thinks that he might want to retire at age 82 in 2024, right now saying it uh, would hurt him. It would, it, would, uh, it would make him a lame duck and less able to pressure or to push for some of the legislation he has. And so I think um, even though I, I, I think it might be the case that he'll want to hand off things to Vice President Harris in 2024, depending on his condition, medical condition and that, I think saying he's going to run, in, it, 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 it suggests a greater confidence and a greater sense that he is in good shape and can continue to, to function as president. And I think that um, is important. And I, I think uh, for that reason, I was I was a little surprised by how quickly he made that statement. But I thought, in retrospect, I thought it probably was the right way to handle it. That's a great point. That if he said no, then he's immediately a lame duck, and and we immediately start thinking about who's yeah. It, that's that's a good point. No matter what, it, it, that's probably the right answer. Whether. That's really what's on his heart. We'll have to wait and see, but it's, it's the right answer to give. Very interesting. All right, that kind of sets the table. Now I want to hear from you. We have several people on the line, Mike, Bruce, others. Hold on. And, and if you want to call in, there's the number, 615-737-PLUS, 615-737-7587. How do you think the first 100 days have gone? What are, what are your thoughts? Love to hear from you. Take a break. Be back right after this.